Hello and welcome to Nailing It Down here at Varmblog. And today we continue our discussion of Carl Kors's introduction to the Critique of the Goethe program from 1922, 1923, which was published in Marxism and Philosophy, originally in German in 1923, and in English in 1970, influencing the New Left. Now, as part of this, dare I say, epically long discussion of the primary secondary and tertiary sources and, and interpretive traditions around the critique of the Goethe program, we do have to go into Korsh's introduction. One, it was considered a counter reading to, to Lenin's um, and one of the other important readings of critique of Goethe. And two, it is also in the context of the adoption of the Gorlitz program adopted by the essay day at the Gorlitz party conference of 1921. The Gorlitz program replaces the Offit program uh, in uh, 1891, which was signed on to by Ingalls and was opposed by a lot of the communists, communist workers, United Social Democrats, etc. Later on, it itself was replaced later by the Heidel by the Heidelberg program of 1925. All right. One of the reasons I bring this up is I feel like this is under discussed, and part of what Course is responding to with the critique of the Goethe program is critiquing the Gerlitz program from his standpoint. I believe in this time he would have been still in the um, the United Social Democratic faction, but he may have been in the K uh, he was not yet in the KA payday, so the KA payday. Um, The, the Gorlitz program was actually largely developed by Edward Bernstein and was approved uh, with only five votes against. It was decidedly revisionist. Um, and you need to know this to kind of understand what Korsh is actually arguing with, because he's not just arguing with, like, say, Lenin's interpretation of the Goethe critique. He's also arguing with the Gerlitz program as it existed at the time. And if you don't know that, um, some of what's actually at stake for Korsh in this reading is a little bit obscure. Um, So it's interesting that Bernstein's program was to continue influential uh, on on the Gorlitz program because Bernstein himself was actually in the Independent Social Democratic Party at the time, or the U.S. Bay Day. Uh, so, in many ways, a lot of the left, both the anti-war Social Democrats and the Communists, had separated um, from the from the German Social Democratic Party by 1921 and one of the things that Korsh may be doing here is actually saying that the Gerlitz program is not just Lasallian it's sub Lasallian it's Lasallian without any of Lasalle's spirit and in fact what's interesting about Korsh's reading as opposed to later more left communist and Marxist humanist readings of the Goethe program is that Korsh is actually kind of nicer to the Lasallians and um, harsher on the Eisenknockers than you would expect him to be. All right, let's get into the text here, though. We're in section two, the revival of the workers' movement, 1849 to 1875. In the 1860s, after a long period in which the workers' movement of emancipation of 1848-49 had first been bloodedly suppressed and then lulled, there was the last signs of the reawakening of the working class in the most industrialized countries of Europe. That's a quote. As a result, the International Workingmen's Association, the first international, was founded in London on September 28, 1864, with Karl Marx as a leading participant. It lasted until 1874-76. In the inaugural address, Marx prepared for the founding of the 
IWA, there, there is the following picture, concise and rich, of the general character of the post-revolutionary epoch between 1848 and the formation of the First International. Long quote from Marx. After the failure of the revolutions of 1848, our party organizations and party journals of the working class were, on the continent, crushed by the iron hand of force. Quote, the most advanced sons of labor fled in despair to the transatlantic republic. That's uh, the that's either England or the United States, I think, there. And the short-lived dream of emancipation vanished before an epoch of industrial fever. Moral degeneration and political reaction. The defeat of the continental working classes, owing partly to the diplomacy of the English government, then, as now, in a fraternal solidarity with the cabinet of St. Petersburg, a.k.a. the two great empires of Marx's time, the Russians and the English, soon spread its contagious effects to, the side of the, to this side of the channel, where the rout of their continental brethren unmanned the English working classes and broke their faith in their own cause. It restored to the landlord and the capitalists their somewhat shaken confidence. Their insolently withdrew concessions already advertised. The discovery of new gold lands to an immense e led to an immense exodus, leaving to an irrevocable void in the ranks of the British proletariat. Others of the formerly active members were caught by the temporary bribe of greater work and wages and turned into loyal workers. While the effort made to sustain or remodel, the Chartist movement failed quite unambiguously. The press organs of the working class died one by one of the apathy of the masses, and in, in point of fact, never before did the English working class seem so thoroughly reconciled to the state of political nullity. If then there had been no solidarity of action between the British and the continental working classes, there was, at all events, a solidarity of defeat in Marx's uh, inaugural address. Back to Korsh. When, after a period of defeat, the first hopes were aroused again, Marx and Engels eagerly seized on the first occasion to, quote, do significantly practical and theoretical work, once again, on a writer scale within the movement of the proletarian emancipation. Nevertheless, they were clear that it was not yet possible at this stage to use the, quote, old audacity of language employed in the Communist Manifesto of 1847-48. Uh, the task was rather to have a position which was resolute, substantive, did not compromise on any question of principle, but made it politically effective in its form that was broad and cautious and did not exclude any sympathetic collaborators. With this in mind, Marx wrote in the inaugural address in the Provisional Statutes of the IWA, which were later adopted by the Geneva Congress in 1866 with few alterations. The reader will see that apart from a vacuous final section, which Marx only added reluctantly and under the pressure of necessity, this declaration of principles expressed in substance the basic idea of communism just as accurately and as verbally much more passionate and storm, just actually as a verbally much more passionate and stormy manifesto of the Communist League. Asterisk, this is where I'm talking. I think it's interesting that there's a part of the end of the statutes and the Geneva Congress where Korsh feels that Marx is pressured, uh, but he doesn't cite how he knows that. Um, and that may be a little bit of his own historical interpretation of trying to like wash out something in Marx that isn't entirely copacetic with his point of view. Not that everyone else isn't always doing that, but it's something to think of. But I think there's probably some evidence I've read in other places that Marx actually was somewhat making concessions to the spirit of the organization, um, just like he was in his platform that he put in the 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 manifesto of the Communist League, which for its preface and, and all that is really fiery and blustery, but its actual um, program's fairly mild. And it wasn't even the program that was adopted. Uh, the program that actually got passed by the Communist League was even milder than the one Marx put in. Anyway. Um, back to this text. As for a decade between 1864 and 1874, Marx and Engels reckoned that the working masses of Europe had acquired a greater awareness of the real preconditions of emancipating workers. Engels gave the following picture of the importance of this period in his 1890 preface to the Communist Manifesto. This is a long Engels quote from the 1890 preface to the Communist Manifesto. Quote, when the working classes of Europe had gathered sufficient strength for the new onslaught upon the power of the ruling class, the International Workingmen's Association came into being. Its aim was to reel together into one huge army, the whole militant working class of Europe and America. Therefore, it could not set out from the principle laid down in the manifesto. It was bound to have a program which would not shut the door on English trade unions, the French, Belgian, 
Italian and Spanish Prodonist, and the German Lasallians. Their program, the preamble to the Statutes of the International, were drawn up by Marx with a master hand, acknowledged even by Bakunin and the anarchist. For the ultimate triumph of the idea set forth in the manifesto, Marx relied solely and exclusively on the, upon the intellectual development of the working class. I want to focus on that because it, it makes the idea of the socialists coming from outside the working class um, somewhat questionable. As it was necessarily necessarily had to ensue from the united action and discussion. The events of vicissitudes in the struggle against capital, quote, the defeats even more than the successes, could not but demonstrate to the fighters the inadequacy hitherto of the universal panaceas and make their minds more receptive to a thorough understanding of the true, of the true conditions for emancipation of the workers. And Marx was right. The working class of 1874 at the dissolution of the international was altogether different from that of 1864 at its foundation. Prodonism in the Latin countries and Lasallianism in Germany were dying out, and even the arch-conservative English trade unions were gradually approaching to the point where, in 1887, the chairman of the Swansea Congress would say in their name, Continental Socialism has lost its terror for us. Yet, by 1887, Continental Socialism was almost exclusively the theory heralded in the manifesto, unquote. And that is from... Um, Engels' Selected Works Volume, um, Marx and Engels' Selected Works Volume 1. That is undoubtedly a letter. All right. In the middle of the 1870s, then, Marx and Engels thought it was far more possible than they had 10 years earlier for the socialist and communist movement in the event countries to return to the old audacity of the 1847 uh, 1848 manifesto by exhibiting a declaration of principles. In any case, they had thought their movement had developed to an extent that any retreat from what they had said in 1864 must appeal to be an unforgivable crime against the future of the workers' movement. Thus, Marx himself says in an accompanying note in his critique of the Goethe program that there was a need to make a declaration of principles when conditions would not allow it, but when conditions had progressed so much since 1864, it was utterly impermissible to demoralize the party with a shallow and unprincipled program. This illustrates some of Marx's preoccupations. When writing the critique of the Goethe program, he demanded from the declaration of principles of the most advanced social democratic party as a minimum the same liberal principles and concrete demands as he himself had been able to insert into another declaration of principles 10 years earlier. This declaration had been drafted under much less favorable circumstances and was designed for the common program of various socialist, half-socialist, and quarter socialist tendencies in Europe and America. Wherever the Goethe program failed to meet this minimum condition, Marx considered it to have fallen below the level already reached by the movement. Hence, even if it appeared to suit the state of the party in Germany, it was bound to do harm to future development of the movement. Section three, Marx and LaSalle. And on this, I think um, we know more about LaSalle than Korsh did at the time, For uh, although a lot of it was known then. I actually find it interesting that he attributes some of LaSallean positions to the Eisenknockers. He really seems to have something out for Babel. And he, Korsh, also thinks that... Um, the LaSallean tendency was not was in some ways more copacetic than it seems to be, seems to be believed by later tendencies. Now, this is one of the interesting things because I think a lot of people think that the hatred of LaSalle uh, is emphasized a lot by Korsh, and thus you know this big distinction that made made a lot by like Marxist humanists and left communists later about the corruption here goes back to Korsh. But Korsh, while he has strong disagreements with LaSalle and it's pretty condemning, uh, seems to think that LaSalleanism is actually a worse beast than anything LaSalle actually encouraged, which is interesting, um, given LaSalle's sort of tendency to side with factions of the state. Um, but we'll, we'll get into that later. So here's what Course says on the Marx and LaSalle question. One can acquire a deeper understanding of the basic proposition of the critique by looking at the historical and intellectual relations and conflicts between the two world historical personalities, Marx and LaSalle. The reader must learn to see Marx's letter in terms of a great dispute between LaSalle and Marx, i.e. between the already developed and philosophically idealist German socialism 
in an international Marxist communism that was still in the initial process of developing on a far mightier scale. It was the circumstances surrounding the Goethe Unification Congress that served for the external reason for Marx's conviction that it was necessary to have such a dispute at the time. We know that at Goethe, some former Lasallians, the Argemein Deutsches Arbeiter Verein, uh, and the former Eisenachers, the Socialist Arbeiterpartie Deutschlands, came together to form the United Socialist Arbeiterpartie Deutschlands. Up until then, the Eisenach tendency had appeared to be a Marxist one, owing to historical and partly personal and contingent factors, which one can study in Mehring's biography of Marx. Mehring's a fascinating character. He's a big player in, in, both, in multiple internationals. He's actually kind of important to the Chinese Revolution. Um, he, there's a lot going on with Mehring. All right. Let's get in there. All right. Uh, continued factors in which one can study in Marion's biography of Marx or his history of German social democracy. At the same time, it must be rather surprising to see how partisanly Marx is in his critique of the Goethe program, attributes every single defect and mistake in the unified German party program to the Lasallianist tendency. This is especially surprising if one recalls his tolerance and patience towards totally uncommunist principles of many sections of the International Working Association. Asterisk. I, I have often thought about how much he put up from the Chartists that he didn't put up with from the Lasallians. And he praised LaSalle at his death, even though he also said horrible things about him, was fighting with him his whole life. Um, but thought that workers' unity was important, which makes his Goethe program critique to be so important you know, a little bit harder to understand. I, I tend to agree um, that it was important and people who try to downplay it like Lars Lee right now are, are maybe not doing the best, but that there is some things to reconcile there. Like, why was the sectarian commitment more acceptable in the 1870s and 1880s, 1890s than it was in the 1860s? All right. This is especially surprising for former calls tolerance and patience towards the totally uncommunist principles of many sections of the International Working Association, which he formed and led. Lasalle, over had been dead for more than a decade. He had not even been alive when the IWA had been set up in 1864. Also, it was evident from the theoretical writings and by their practical positions on many questions, and emerges particularly clearly from Mehring's neutral account, that Lasalle and her were in many ways better Marxists than the Eisenacher. Asterisk. Uh, it is interesting that even though Marx plays LaSalle when he died, he also kept his people out of any LaSallean program like the All German Workers League. Anyway. Marx appears to go too far in his criticisms of the corrupting and demoralizing influence of LaSallianism in the draft program. To which I think is interesting that so many people think that a lot of the total anti lasallianism uh, often attributed to, um, to Marx uh, comes back to this course reading. And I, I think course is actually, for example, more forgiving of LaSalle than Lenin was, who doesn't really deal with him at all. To gain a full understanding of the real meaning and theoretical and historical justification of this, one must go deeper and realize that Marx was a thinker and politician who was highly conscious of the historical responsibilities and for working for the world, unquote. In dealing with a draft program, he was not backing the Eisenach tendency in German social democracy against the Lasallians, whether he was trying to fight and demolish the Lasallian spirit, which was much more influential than the Marxist spirit among both the Eisenachers and the Lasallianer. Karl Marx wrote the greater part of his letter against the living LaSalle. He was trying retrospectively and definitively to demolish LaSalle's conception of society, which was based on the philosophy of right and of the state, and therefore on idealism. Um, Marx was very critical of LaSalle's state-centric views. His aim was to replace it theoretically and practically with materialist conception of history founded on the economy. 
This was the outlook for over 30 years. And in alliance with, with the few who understood him, he struggled and labored to advance. One can say that from 1843, when he attained a decisive materialist outlook in his critique of Fagel's philosophy of right, all of Marx's writings and actions were fundamentally contributions to the advance of this materialist outlook and practice against the ever-growing army of its opponents, both within and without the walls of the proletarian camp. We know too well now that this struggle was necessary today as it was 50 or 80 years ago. The irony of history has willed it that, numer that the numerically strongest socialist tendency in Germany, the, social, the German Social Democratic Party, the SPD, has formally abandoned Marxism in its new Gorlitz, Gorlitz program of September 23rd, 1921, which is the Bernsteinist and revisionist program. Um, in place of... The, the SPD once again has written on its banners the slogans of LaSalle, which Marx tried to annihilate in this critique of the Goethe program. Of course, it has all the repeated words of LaSalle since the German Social Democratic Party of 1921, which rejects Marxism, has little to do with the spirit of LaSalle as that, with that of Marx. In LaSalle's great speech of 1862, which is called the Workers' Program, on the special connection of the present historical period with the idea of the working class, there are many formulations which conflict with the Gorlitz program of 1921. Among these is a clear statement that, quote, the period of history which began in the spring of 1848 will not produce a state, whether of monarchy or republican form, which expresses or maintains political dominion of the third state. At the same time, the reference to the foul by the defenders of the Gorlitz program still has a certain significance. If it was said that this was 18... 62 and not 1923, we might demand uh, <clears throat> we might still regard the program of the Party of the Working People as a product of a Salian doctrine. And one in the same breath, it describes the struggle to liberate the proletariat as a historical necessity and as an ethical demand. And it declares its intention to struggle for the popular will organized in the free people state to dominate the economy and society. Remember how much Marx hated the free people state talk people. This is Barn talking. He really hated that uh, in specific. And so did Ingalls. Such a program could only properly be called the Salian. However, if something was very different, were said in private. For everything LaSalle ever wrote about or said about universal suffrage and related matters is put in a totally different light by what he once said in true bourgeois style to his, own, to his close circle confidants. Quote, whatever I say universal suffrage, you must understand me to mean revolution and only revolution. However true this may be, and we do not unfortunately have amongst us the living in LaSalle to contradict the dead Braun, Quenau, Kampfmeier, and their companions, LaSalle's revolutionary slogans of 1862 have been criminally used to justify and establish a completely non-revolutionary and even anti-revolutionary petit bourgeois and utterly hopeless program of utopian reform. LaSalle only survives in the printed form and in literature, but he is far less able to combat these caricatures than another powerful opponent of them who survives in the same form, Karl Marx. So this leads us to the question of how the Salian program is comparable to the Bernsteinian program. Now, I said that Bernstein was in the USPD. When a lot of the USPD joined the KPD, our, our, um, the Bernstein, after the war, reconciled himself back to the SPD and took a leadership role in the SPD. And it was during this time period where it developed um, a, this this program that would become the Gerlis program. But it's also during this time period in, in 1919 that he produced a series of collective writings on Ferdinand LaSalle. So this is an interesting thing to deal with because while Bernstein had originally been seen as one of the Eisenknockers, in fact, in 1872, he had joined the Eisenknocker camp, and uh, uh, was a key member with Babel and with Liebknecht in the Unification Party and considered uh, someone who, with whom Engels interacted um, and who was a serious 
a contender of the Marxist program by 1919, when he reconciles himself to the SPD, he starts reconciling himself to Ferdinand LaSalle's legacy. Prior to that, LaSalle was both in the LaSalle faction in the SPD and in the and kind of influencing the last generation of the German historical school economist and of German socialism, which was completely separate from this and was more of a class compact thing, a, a kind of proto-national socialist without its fascist edge. Um, it's important to realize this, that Bernstein's coming back uh, was kind of Uh, a concession to the right, which he had broke with during World War One. So I find it ironic that he had so much influence on on the party of 1919, 1920, 1920, 1921, because he had so thoroughly left it, uh, Wodkowski, um, in 1917. Anyway. I hope this clarifies some things for you. I had to uh, do a little bit of additional research in German this time because uh, a lot of the stuff on the SPD in the 1920s doesn't seem to be available in English. Um, and that is interesting. Um, so that's something. And another little historical side note that I should give you guys while we are in this part of the text. Um, let's talk about Franz Mehring for a second. Franz Mehring uh, was important. He was um, originally um, a national liberal. Um, then in the 1880s, he became a social democrat. Um, he wrote both an important biography of Karl Marx and um, a history of the matter. He was uh, an editorial writer for the New Times or the Die New Gazette. And um, he taught at the party school. When Ebert and Bernstein started representing reform-oriented uh, positions, uh, Mehring sided with Liebknecht and doubled down on traditional class struggle. Um, and he often sided with both Luxembourg and Clara Zetkin. Um, he was a co-editor of the International and founded the Spartacus Group. Um, and that's important for a variety of reasons. Uh, Mehring being cited here is also one of the founders of the KP Day in 1918. So it's important to see all the figures being brought up by Korsh here. It's hard to say that he's purely siding with the, with the left communist factions um, or he's being particularly unfair, of course, to the Lasallians. If anything, he's fairer than later writers. Anyway, and on that note, we're going to end. Mm -hmm.